Chris, John, and Tim. Uh, oh, sorry. It was J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, so anyway, Chris, John, and Tim in the middle from Blue Coat talking about malware's art. So please give them a warm round of applause. Yeah, so John likes to reference Big Bang Theory, and it's Dr. Dr. Mister. Oh, give me my clicker. I got a clicker. Got a laser pointer in case the moose head acts up. Um, okay, so the outline, we're going to start off talking a little bit about hunting for malware on the web, and then taking what you find and doing our early efforts at making it look cool, and then our better efforts at making it look cool, and then some of the practical applications of it. So several years ago when um, people were starting to worry about malware on the web and the browser as, as a primary infection vector, we, we actually had a meeting and we talked about what are we going to do to address this, how are we going to keep up, and, and what should our, our focus be. And we came up with what we thought were our kind of our starting, you want to start from your strengths, right? And so we have this existing cloud infrastructure, there's lots of web traffic, millions of customers sending us URLs. And we already had tools that we used for parsing web pages and figuring out what language it was in and some really cool textual analysis and machine learning stuff to figure out what the content was about. So we can adapt these, got to be able to adapt these for malware hunting. So it should be easy for us to find bad stuff if we really put our minds to it. And there's a principle here I call the zebra herd principle, that if you're a zebra in Africa, you want to belong to a really big herd because then the odds of you personally being eaten go down as your herd size goes up. And there's an interesting corollary that if your herd contains some young and foolish zebras, it's even better for you because you let them go into the bushes and find the predators. <clears throat> and we see this in action in our user base because at the extreme low end of the, of the stupid user curve, we have a, a free product called K9 that we give away to families. And originally it was built, this is a public service announcement by the way, so originally this was built by those of us that are dads. We worry about our kids being exposed to inappropriate stuff. But I know there are a lot of people here that like inappropriate stuff. And so you should consider running K9 in, in addition to your desktop antivirus if you're a Windows or a Mac user because it will catch a bunch of malware that your AV software won't. Um, it's specifically built to complement that. And you can always tell it to let the porn through if you want. But anyway, so, so we have a couple million K9 downloads, and out of 75 million users, that's about 3% of our user base. But if we look in the logs and we see somebody was going to malware and we put up a warning page, 15% of the time it's a K9 user. So they punch way above their weight when it comes to finding malware. And on the weekends, that spikes to 30% because a lot of the big organizational customers' user base is, is home as, as K9 users. And we could tell you stories you know, about foolish user behavior that we see in the logs. And as an engineer, your first response when you see somebody blast right through a malware block page that you put up and say, don't go here, this is malware, and because they were the one who installed it, they have the password, and so they can put their admin password in an override, all right? And I've seen this happen in one, one user's case twice, where we, he, was, he was surfing for pirated software, he went to Google's Excel 2007 cracked version, looked down the list of stuff that Google gave him, clicked on one, and this was a site that was not a real wear site, it was a fake wear site. So it said it had all these cracks, and so we knew this was bad, so we had to put up a block page. We saw this in the logs. There's the block page. He put his password in, thinking, oh, oh those blue coat guys trying to keep me away from my wares by telling me it's dangerous. <laughs> put his password in, and then found, got the site, went down the list. Here's the cracked version he wants, clicks on that. That's a link to a, a, an actual malware download that's masquerading as the crack he wanted. Again, we put up the block page again, he put his password in and went and got infected, right? So as an engineer, your first reaction is, we've got to fix the block page, right? We've got to somehow keep the user from hurling himself over the cliff, put up a better guardrail. And then eventually you realize, no, that's, this is a circle of life kind of thing. That zebra, whoever he is, is doing his part to keep the rest of the herd safer, right? So you, you just roll with that and, and, and live with that. So anyway, so the cool stuff, when you went, yeah, hand for our anonymous zebras, you go zebras. <laughs> And, and so when you, the, the fun stuff comes when you actually find some malware, right? So here's a server exploit kit, and it's serving a malware payload. And so we say, hey, we, found, we, we caught a malware, right? Now, pat on the back, good job. No, that's just, that's, that's just the beginning of the process, right? Because you want to look and say, 
what else is going on there? If we find one malware, what are the odds that this bad guy is running additional exploit servers, right? Because bad guys like redundancy in their networks. And so we can look for similar named payloads, similar paths, similar named domains, same IP, close IP range. You know, you could start, expand your search a bit and find other stuff. And then the other thing you want to do is you want to say, well, how did the user get there, right? He did, he would, like the example of our foolish zebra, he did not set out to find malware. He was doing something else and the malware happened. And so you want to look back in the logs, follow the referrer back in the HTTP header and say, where did he come from? Oh, he came from this relay server. All right, well, first principle again, are there other relay servers in this network? Okay, and then how did he get to the relay server? Oh, came from this bait page. Are there more bait pages in this network? Yes, okay. And eventually, as you trace back, you hit a trusted site like a Facebook or a Google or a Hotmail, and you say, okay, we know this site was not deliberately part of the attack. This was an innocent site. Most likely, the bad guys did not lure him to Google and then infected him. He was, they took advantage of the fact that so many zebras come to that watering hole, right? So that's where they want to set up the ambushes. And so then this part of the network that, that starts from the trusted sites, so everything from the below the trusted site down, they call this is the malware delivery network. This is a whole network of sites and servers that are set up for the express purpose of infecting people. And so we call that a malnet for short. And there's also an interesting corollary here that I'll, I'll point out. For a given zebra who's starting down the attack chain, because this is a long complex chain, you only have to break that's Tim's little cool, isn't that cool? Hand for Tim, that's a way cool graphic. You only have to break one link in the chain and that zebra is now safe from the attack. Okay, so that's, that's two-dimensional mapping, right? That's our picture, that's our beginning picture of a malware network is this horizontal and vertical mapping, but there's a third dimension. And the third dimension, of course, is time in a two-dimensional world. And so you wanna say, hey, tomorrow, how much of this malnet infrastructure is still in place, right? We know the bad guys are changing their payloads dynamically. We know they change the, the sites that are serving stuff. They, they go through domain names like gangbusters, like hackers at an evening beer party, right? So they're, they're, they're rotating a lot of the stuff and churning a lot, but there's other stuff they don't, right? So now that gives you, say, a basis to say, we could maybe track the infrastructure, the network going forward, and that has some interesting implications. Because if you can track the network, right, and you can still break one of the links in that chain tomorrow, it no longer matters what kind of attack is down at the very end. Zero-day exploit doesn't matter. How the payload's encrypted doesn't matter. And how often they change the domains down there doesn't matter, right, because you're not even looking at all that stuff. And you can't, I'm not, I'm not claiming you can do this for everything, right, but the stuff you can do it for is really cool. All right, so all the stuff the bad guys are good at doing doesn't help them in this scenario. And that's kind of cool. And now we have this cool two-dimensional malware visualization thing in our heads that's evolving over time. And so the challenge becomes, how do we put this visually something that we can use as a tool, and also how can we show other people this picture we have in our heads? And so I'll turn the time over to Tim to talk about that. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, early malnet visual visualization. So why do we want to visualize things? Well, first, a picture can really say a thousand words. We're dealing with uh, text logs that uh, aren't a lot of fun for other people to look at. Um, taking a look at the picture of the jet here, you can tell, hey, this is a jet, and you can also tell, hey, there's some interesting stuff going on right around the engine. I have no idea what this image actually is. Is that temperature? Is that you know friction? I don't, I don't know what that is. But you can tell, hey, something is going on with that. Uh, visualization can really empower your understanding. We were seeing that the, there was this large infrastructure built up by the bad guys to get malware to the victims, to drive, mal, to drive people to their exploit servers. So we said, I think it would, it would really be useful to kind of visualize this and, and get a, you know, just get a picture of the scale and, and impact of what these guys are doing. So we put a lot of work into it and we, uh, we said, well, there's lots of different ways that we could visualize. Uh, essentially, we're, it's a network graph. Uh, we have interconnected nodes. There's lots of different ways that we can visualize these things. I'm not a graphics person, so I looked for a nice library that would do it for me. And I came upon a library called GraphViz, which has been around for a very long time. Very good graph software. Um, and it worked well for the small, for the small malnets that we were doing. Um, put a lot of work into it, and I'm gonna show you our first image. It's fantastic. <coughs> but kind of hard to interpret and make anything useful out of. So this is a sampling of the, of the malware and uh, the pass to that malware that we saw in one of our data centers on one day. 
So I'll highlight some portions. You can see a little bit of structure there, a little bit of structure there, a little bit of structure there, and then something really big down in the bottom. What is that? So we did a lot of manual digging in because this is the initial version of the tool. We found out that this, all these lines here, that's a malvertising attack. Uh, someone had uh, compromised an ad stream and was get, casting a very large net and luring people into their, uh, well, silently luring their browsers into a, a drive-by download attack. So even though it took a lot of work to get this image, it's not really all that useful. So we started to create kind of a tree view, kind of flowing from top to bottom of the paths. We, we can see all these domains and URLs funneling into this single point. Visually, we can say, you know what? That's something interesting. What is that? What is that pink node? Is that pink node a willing participant? Is that pink node an unwilling participant? What we found out was this node was an unwilling participant. This was kind of the, uh, uh, an ad page on a specific website where all the pages on that site would eventually go to this page to show an ad before continuing on to read the article. This node, however, he was a willing participant. And there we have at the bottom the malware stuff. So we were starting to get some better stuff you know, much better than our, than our previous image. Uh, this is a graph, an early graph of illustrating a search engine, an actual search engine poisoning attack. So on the end, we have our traffic drivers. These are all the users going into these central relay points and then following the arrows down, it's funneling all the traffic down into uh, the malware server. Uh, we can drill down into uh, kind of uh, the beginning of the traffic drivers. These are all Google search engine domain names from different countries. So they're very hard to read, but uh, yeah, that's a dozen different countries that uh, uh, were relaying people to this malware server. Down in the bottom here, we have the, uh, the malicious site. So all this infrastructure was set up to collect users and drive them into the malware site. Uh, kind of the last uh, big image that we produced with GraphViz was kind of a, a group photo. This is a snapshot from, uh, I think, a single day in one of our data centers. And you can see a lot of complicated infrastructure has been set up by the bad guys to drive traffic and to serve malware to their victims. So I, I took it as far as I could, not being a graphics person. Uh, we had John come on our team, who was much better at Malnet visualization, and he's going to talk about that. Yeah, I got involved with this project about this point, and I assume I'm the odd man out of, of everybody here because uh, my background's actually not only in graphics, but uh, most of particular movies. Uh, I used to work at DreamWorks Animation, and I, I, for example, I was involved in the production of movies like uh, Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon, and Kung Fu Panda. Uh, and, it, and so, um, so I, I got roped into this with the specific goal being, well, what, what can we do to make the graphs look more interesting, be easier to understand, et cetera. And so you might ask yourself, what in the world does graph visualization have to do with graphics in general, movies specifically? You know, take your pick. Uh, actually, surprisingly, there's a lot in common. Um, you know, when you think about it, as humans, our strongest sense is vision. We're really good at seeing stuff. We're really good at picking things out. Like, for example, I don't know about you guys, but I've had a few unbelievably annoying coworkers who, you know, like one job, I was actually at a big long table with other people, and there were a couple people down the row who would not hold still. They're just constantly fidgeting and moving and stuff, and it's just unbelievably distracting. You know, just human vision is just, it really sucks into things. And so, like, in this case, you know, with the, image of Puss in Boots up there, you know, what kind of things can you pick up just by seeing that one frame out of the entire movie? Well, he's obviously pleading for something. You can tell by the angle of the neck and shoulders, he's standing upright, you know, even if you've never seen the movie, he's holding a hat. Um, and those big eyes, frankly, I find just pretty creepy. But, um, you know, there's so much we can see just by looking at it. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with the Malnets, as well as make it reasonably aesthetically pleasing. So what are the kind of things that we can get wrong when it comes to graphics? We can actually get a ton wrong. So there's a couple film examples. 
Um, this is an image of puss where there was an extra zero added by average, um, just one zero added accidentally on the length of the fur. And we end up with him being a chia pet. Um, here's, here's a case where Shrek, um, like they wanted to have wind just making his ears move a little bit because he's supposed to be on a ship. And once again, they added an extra zero and the wind's just tugging his ears off. Um, there's a case where, uh, similarly, the, the facial animation was just applied way too strongly and frankly it looks like he's going to eat the camera. Um, and then, this is my personal favorite, that's supposed to be one of the princesses, I'm not sure who, but uh, that's quite a sexy hairstyle. <laughs> so, there's, it's really, really easy to get things wrong. Graphics often comes down to a lot of knobs you have to turn. And so, you know, what are, what are big challenges to really make this work? Well, I mentioned we really want for someone to be able to look at the Malnet and understand what it's doing and uh, have it be clear. And so, making sure that it's presented in the right way. Also, th this is honestly a really unique application when it comes to graph visualization. I mean, people have done graph visualization for a long time. That, that open source um, Linux tool that Tim was using at first has been around forever, but it didn't work. We really need something custom that will work with the size of these Malnets. They're really small compared to full internet connectivity graphs, but they're really large compared to what people normally visualize. Um, we're also really, we've always been interested in being able to show them in three particular ways, why they're inter interactive, so someone can sit down with it, play with it, and say, what's going on here? You know, what are they up to? But also be able to automatically capture snapshots, say to throw up on the web, or capture videos. Um, but then for video specifically, we've also been interested in three timelines, whether it would just be a static view or we'd see it growing over time as more domains are added or fully dynamic where we also see uh, the domains that are taken down as, uh, you know, the people who are running this malware operation keep cycling stuff so their domains won't get blocked. Um, and then finally, um, you know, because of all of these, we really just can't directly use the existing visualization technology for graphs. We just need to do something kind of unique. So that's what we'll talk about briefly. So just like with movies, there's a lot we can get wrong here. Here's, uh, here's one of the images we came up with where, frankly, it just looks like a hairball. Things just didn't get spread out in a clear fashion. Or here's a really nice ball of twine where, and this is a really common graph layout where you put everything in a circle. And in this case, it's uh, just way too much detail to do that. Um, uh, here's a nice spider web where, once again, things are just kind of evenly distributed, but all the links in between each one of those domains, all the, each one of those nodes, just n no clarity there. Here's yet another circle that's very fun. And, you know, we just really need to make sure we set this right and tune it right. Desired end result is something like this. Uh, clear, crisp, logical to follow, and on top of that, being obvious what each one of these domains is doing in the network. And so everything's colored. So where red are the malicious hosts, those are specifically payload servers or very, very core infrastructure. The yellow are the intermediary hosts, which might be unwilling participants, hacked or whatnot, or perhaps just hosting ads where one of the ads is, uh, you know, specifically for malware. And then the green are the known uh, benign dom domains like Google, which frankly, honestly, Google, as we all know, is one of the biggest vectors to find malware, but, you know, they don't do it on purpose. Question. Yes? Uh, we've, we actually played a bit with 3D, uh, but we found that with these Malnets, they weren't large enough to nece necessitate 3D. Uh, in fact, the, you know, of course, you know, why reinvent the wheel? So while we needed a custom solution, we still stuck with um, an building on top of an open source library, which uh, supports, uh, you know, true 3D rendering, but we just didn't really make use of it, just didn't need to. So the, the library we built on top of is called Jung. It was developed at um, UC Davis, and it's a nice library. It definitely helped get us up to speed quickly, but it was developed by three doctoral students, and every single step along the way, they made the kind of decisions you would expect academics to make, meaning every time they had a chance to do so, they made the choices that ended up making the software even slower and slower. 
Uh, and so it's horribly slow, but at the same time, um, I definitely am not knocking it because frankly it's extremely extensible and we were able to make really great use out of it. Unfortunately, the Malnets just aren't so big that we need extremely high performance graphics software. Um, so the key customizations that, and extensions that we did are large in number. Uh, we ended up customizing a large amount of things within this and extending it in a number of ways. And we'll go over some of the most interesting. Um, so uh, the layout algorithm, you know, making sure everything's placed in a way that makes sense, is logical, is nice. Um, we use the FR force directed algorithm. I'm not going to try to pronounce the names of the uh, two people who invented it, but it's really cool. Essentially, it's like connecting all of the nodes in the graph with springs that either push or pull and then letting it go and see how things end up balancing out. And that involves a temperature, which really all that means is imagine it slowly cooling to the point where it freezes and nothing can move anymore. And that just makes sure that things stop moving eventually. And we also reduce the repulsion and attraction factors just because we're talking about relatively large graphs for visualization, just to make sure we don't end up with junk like shown in those two images where either everything collapses black hole like or everything pushes out to the edges. Uh, one of the other things we looked at was limited horizon. Uh, you know, this is the largest Malnet we've been tracking. Uh, it has thousands of domains every day, and the turnover of those domains is very high. These, these guys keep busy moving their infrastructure around. Uh, but showing that much isn't always best, because frankly, you can see interesting things, like that blossom of red at the top middle, um, how all of that funnels down to a green node surrounded by a bunch of black, all the links going through it. That's Google. And those are all links going straight from Google to malware domains. Uh, but there's so much there, there's a lot that's just hard to see. So what would be nice is to be able to just focus in on what we want. The idea essentially being that um, the user can select a given domain and say, I only want to see domains that are connected to here within, say, two or three hops, and be able to see just that small slice of the malnet. Uh, also, uh, the ability to toggle labels and do so intelligently. Now, there's so many domains here. If we labeled every single one with the domain name, it would just be a huge clutter. And so instead, we've set it up in this case where you only see two labels, and those two are actually the domains at core involved in the MySQL hack that we all know about. So, anti-aliasing. Now, because this isn't a graphics conference, you're probably asking yourself, what the crap is anti-aliasing? Well. It's Jaggies, and because I have been a long-term gamer, I'd like to use an example that takes us down Retro Alley. So, I don't know about you guys, Show but... Show hands, who has one of these? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have to admit, when it comes to the old school gaming, I'm kind of, kind of a Commodore 64 fan myself. But, um, you know, old school gaming, I don't know about you guys, but I get um, a bit of nerd nirvana when it comes to you know, these good old uh, graphics. Well, when you look at, look at these old school graphics, I mean, it looks like they're made out of blocks. Well, that's kind of the extreme, but it makes it really easy to see these jaggies. Essentially, it's just that everything looks like it has sharp edges. You know, it's not smooth. Um, and Basically, the way to solve this is just to make sure that the edges are smooth. Resolution does help with this, but it absolutely doesn't solve it. You have to make sure that the edges are smooth, which more than anything comes down to the number of colors available. But then aliasing can also happen uh, with respect to time, and that just shows up as j jittering, stuttering, popping, things like that. And what we really need to be able to do is just make sure that both in terms of the image itself as well as one image after another, that everything just looks smooth. It's just an important thing to take into account. Um, and then we really needed specialized appearance for all of the parts of the graph. Uh, so, I mean, on the left is shown what some off-the-shelf software would do, but on the right is our custom thing, but for example, if we just made the nodes, the domain markers, just show up too big, then we end up with just the soup. And so what we actually did is we customized, fully customized the appearance of the nodes, the links, the arrowheads, the labels, and actually do it fully dynamically based on, well, how big is the Malnet? What kind of content is there? Um, and so I'll now turn the time over to Tim. This is our uh, 
fun result that we got. This is specifically generating um, a live video of a few hours of seeing a Malnet evolve, assuming it starts from scratch, and seeing all the infrastructure coming in over just a few hours. And what's awesome is that uh, these domain names really <laughs> Uh, it's one of those things where a human just looking at it, you can tell something's going on in many cases just by the domain names. My favorite one is the red box towards the top middle where the label on it says um, securityconceptual.ru. I don't know about you guys, but that really sounds like malware to me, you know, fake AV. So, so here comes Tim. All right. We should point so, out that as a ShmooCon bonus, we did not obscure the domain names. Like when we put something like this on the web, both because some of the names are a lot a little offensive sometimes and also because we don't want to clue the bad guys in too much to like what we know about their networks we typically um, lead those but you guys would want to see the domain names right all right so this is about a 30 second video like uh, John said it's compressed a, a couple hours how this Malnet grows during the day things to pay attention to are up here there's the green node for google.com you'll see a whole bunch of red nodes uh, surround it and then you can kind of see right here at the bottom mail.live.com a, uh, a web host that's going to be uh, referring that's going to have uh, spam based links to malware all right so i'll let it play so basically pick one green node with your eye and just keep your eye on that Yeah. <laughs> Laser show. <laughs> All right. The other thing that's, that's worth pointing out is that, yeah, this is good job. Good job. Good job. The, the relative, the order and the timing of when the red nodes appear is proportional to when they occurred in the logs. So we actually, on the website, there's a version of this from, I think, October we posted, where it's, the, it's 24 hours, and it starts with just one green node, and then it runs through the 24 hours, and the, the timing with which the nodes appear is proportional to when they really happen. So it's, it's, we could actually extend that out to a full 24 hours, and it'd be boringly slow at that point, but it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of cool. It's way cool. Yeah. Um, before I turn it back over to John, a key takeaway from this is that the bad guys are always there. They just don't roll out infrastructure one day and say, oh, here's, here's the new uh, big bad search term for today. I'm going to build up my infrastructure to do it. The infrastructure is already in place. They're just changing what the inputs are to it. They have uh, quite, a, quite a bit of IT uh, put into place to, uh, to make this happen. Yeah. One, of the, one of the ways in which we've actually um, really enjoyed uh, just seeing what kind of domains people are using and what's uh, going through all of this. If we even just play a bit and then pause it pretty much anywhere in here, uh, what we end up getting, whoops, that wasn't quite what I expected. What we end up getting, like, so for example, um, uh, at the bottom right, you know, we see work at home 22.net. You know, it's a, a work at home scam. Um, and then we see a lot of uh, other fun domain names where it's things like, uh, oh, more than anything, what we've actually been seeing are a lot of porn domains. And it seems that the primary lure that they're using is uh, free porn on the internet. You know, come get your free porn here, and while you're going by, we'll give you some nice drive by uh, malware. Uh, so, uh, uh, the one other thing we were interested in doing was being able to do some automated analysis. Uh, you know, once again, with the largest Malnet we've been uh, taking a peek at for fun, uh, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of domains here. There's a lot going on. And as Tim will actually talk about in a few minutes, uh, the MySQL hack was part of one of these larger Malnets and uh, just one part of what they were doing that day. And so, yeah, we really would like something to be able to say, hey, look here, that's interesting. And so we found some fun ways to take advantage of uh, graph analysis techniques that are both, you know, some which are well known for doing internet stuff and others which are actually uh, used for doing social network analysis. And that's something which historically hasn't really been applied to 
internet graphs, but has been of big interest for the federal government for things like uh, just looking at groups and trying to figure out who holds this group together. Uh, you know, why does this group stay together? What are they doing as a whole? Those those kind of things. And it's really just interesting that uh, I think it's really cool that we can use those kind of things to just automatically highlight areas of interest in the graph. So for example, this one, I mentioned before this was Google. Well, you know, automatically it can say, hey, this is a hub, which makes complete sense because Google's sending people all over the place. And it has high influence because frankly, a lot of people will never go to many domains unless if uh, Google or something like that tells them to go there. Um, and also, Google, of course, is essentially handing out endorsements left and right because if Google ever shows something in a search result, for all intents and purposes, Google's endorsing that domain is, yeah, this is where you want to go to get that, you know, whatever you were searching for. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we could use uh, classic internet analysis techniques, but we can also use the social network stuff. Um, and the reason why we can do this is just because, as, as you've seen by the images, Malnets tend to come in between tens to thousands of domains involved. And that intermediate size works pretty well for both types of analysis, even though internet analysis usually is on a really large scale and social network analysis is usually on the small, well, we can go in between. Um, so real briefly, and I bet a bunch of these sound familiar to you guys for you know, the way Google works, et cetera. But I mean, we can do page rank, we can do hits, um, look at it as endorsement, uh, characters to pack, path link and link betweenness. You know, with all of those, we can pretty um, solidly be able to say, yeah, you know, what, what type of domain is this as far as the structure of the Malnet goes? And of course, we only use these just within the bounds of the Malnet, not a larger view of the internet. So as a brief example, uh, consider this where, you know, we see all those yellow nodes with links going into the red node that's kind of in the middle. Um, that is a spam domain. And uh, that's why there's so much feeding into it from all over the place. Uh, many of those yellow nodes are actually um, web-based email clients. And so the person's uh, going from there, clicking on the spam link in their email and ending up at the uh, spam domain. Uh, and you know, the kind of things we see from the, inter from the network analysis are, well, it's an authority because all these, all these different domains and URLs seem to be telling us that this is where we should go. Um, it's got a high page length and a low average path length. Um, the, then with social network analysis, I, I just think this is fun because I, I mean, I've always been a computer guy. I've never gotten into, you know, stuff like uh, psychology and stuff, but it, it's been fun um, seeing how these kind of things can be applied to looking at a Malnet and what each of the domains is doing. Because for example, here, um, you know, the kind of things we can look at are, well, what's the community structure? What's the prestige and influence, reciprocity? But my very favorite one is, is one from the bottom, clicks. Uh, that, you know, they've actually, these scientists who came up with this formally defined clicks, you know, scientifically and use it to analyze social groups. And all that that proves is that high school never ends. Uh, and so as a, as a brief example, uh, so a smaller Malnet, uh, and I put labels there for yahoo.com at the top right in green and google.com at the bottom right in green. And this yellow domain that both of them are leading to is a landing page. Uh, and it has, speaking of you know, the social aspects, it has higher prestige than influence because they're not going to lead back to a search engine, uh, at least not usually. Uh, there, there's the click with the payload server and it's this one-way social role of leading people from the search engines uh, eventually down to the malware. All right, so I just wanted to throw some numbers up here so you can kind of get a, a numerical view of kind of the size and scope of uh, what these Malnets are doing, this infrastructure that the bad guys have built up. So this is uh, two months worth of tracking for uh, five of our networks. You can see uh, this is the number of unique nodes on a daily basis. These are the unique nodes created that day by the bad guys. Uh, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of infrastructure that they're managing. And that's, that's not the, like the bots in a botnet. This is the infrastructure that's getting you to become a botnet, right? So that, those are actually host names, not infected computers. Yep. 
So Schnakul is our largest network. Uh, it does everything. Uh, fake wares, fake antivirus. When, when, when he says our network, we didn't write it, just oh. for the record. <laughs> I mean, a network someone else created. Uh, no, this, these, these are real bad guys, and they are quite diversified. Uh, they're in a lot of different companies or countries around the world. Um, other malnets that we're tracking, they're not so diversified. Some are stuck in primarily one country. Uh, Nargo is uh, divided up between three. So it's interesting to see geographically where the bad guys are, are choosing to put their infrastructure. Uh, drilling down a bit more into uh, Shnakul, we can see where their malware servers are, where their, where their payloads are living. Uh, you'll see, a you know, 5% is in the United States. That's very, very small compared to Germany, which is almost 50%. Compare that to where they're putting their search engine poisoning pages and their relays. Those are primarily in the United States, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, command and control, uh, a big surprise, the majority of the, these servers live in Russia. Uh, we said uh, Schnakul is involved in all sorts of malware. It's also involved in porn. Uh, most of it lives in Germany. And they have a whole bunch of scams, work at home scams, uh, gift card spam, uh, scams, all sorts of stuff. And that's primarily hosted in Russia. So let's take a look at the uh, MySQL.com hack. So the MySQL.com web server was hacked and uh, invisible iframes were injected that were doing a drive-by download to all the database administrators who were going to the site. That's kind of scary because if you want to steal someone's information, you steal the login credentials for the guy who has access to your database or who's even administering your database. Lots of uh, uh, traffic to the site every day. It's in the top thousand sites for traffic. Um, in terms of the exploit that was being served, uh, four out of uh, 44 AV engines on VirusTotal were catching it at the time of the attack. So here's the mysql.com web server hack in the Malnet view. Those are the payload servers involved in the attack that day. Look at everything else that was going on in the Shtakmul Malnet that day. This is just yet another traffic driver for a very large uh, criminal organization. If we dive in a bit more to the, uh, the actual server that was involved, uh, that was serving the malware, uh, this infrastructure was deployed several days before my, the, they, made, they went active on mysql.com. Uh, they put their infrastructure up and they started uh, sending traffic to it to make sure that it was up and running before they began their attack. So if we look what else was on this uh, IP address, this is common knowledge uh, where this attack was hosted. Uh, there were lots of other funny looking domain names. You can see they're not wasting their good names on their exploit kit servers. There were lots and lots of, of small blogs that were compromised that were relaying to these uh, to this exploit server, as well as uh, forum and comment spam that was sending, that had links to send people here. Also, what I thought was interesting was that they were, they were also at the same time that they had hacked MySQL.com, they were doing a malvertising attack on Foreshared and IsoHunt. These bad guys are making a lot of money and they've invested a lot of money into their infrastructure to drive people to malware and, and infect them. Um, back when we in the summer, we started to get the really cool uh, malnets that, thanks to John's work, and we actually used some of the, the malnet graphics as our booth art at Black Hat and gave away t-shirts with malnet diagrams on the back. And I was looking at one of those and I said, oh, you know what this is? This is a quaking aspen. So this is your geeky biology lesson for the day. So how many of you know about quaking aspens? You know, the, the cool thing when you look at a grove of quakies is what? They're not individual trees, okay? These are part of a clonal colony that grow from a common root system. And if you go on Wikipedia and look at Pando, the largest such network has been named by scientists. And Pando is a Latin word, means I expand. So Pando ergo sum, I expand, therefore I am. It's what Pando does, it expands. How, how big? It's estimated to cover 43 hectares of mountainside in central Utah. Um, has an estimated 47,000 individual trunks total biomass of around 6 million kilos. It is the largest known organism on the planet. And with an estimated age of at least 80,000 years, possibly as much as a million, again, according to Wikipedia, it's also the oldest known organism on the planet. It's like, that's cool. That is our, our, uh, 
our mascot and our metaphor for malware, malware networks. This is what they're like. There's this root system underneath that's the common infrastructure that runs all of these servers. And so that's our, uh, that's our cool picture. And I think we're done. We've got the clicker. So we're ready for questions now. <clears throat> Questions, yes. 